Hey, good evening. It's Thursday night in the United Kingdom. My name is Theo Van Dor. I'm the executive producer of Time of the Sixth Sun. In the window below is Nikki Luna Williams, who is the writer, creator, producer of this amazing movie and eight part documentary series. And our guest this evening, joining us from Towson uh, across the pond, is uh, Pat McKay. Welcome, Pat. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad all these conversations are continuing after all these years. Very exciting. Really exciting. And I, I looked today because I, I sent the, the link to our previous talk that we did. It was 11th of December we spoke last, which is, uh, it just feels <laughs> like it's gone past like that. But that's what six months. <laughs> so, uh, so, so lovely to have you back and, uh, and sharing your, your wisdom with us. So I'm going to bring up um, Pat's slide onto the screen so you can get, so if you want to find out more, you can go to uh, Pat's website, which is patmccabe.net. Uh, you can also follow her on facebook.com forward slash woman stands shining. And I'll put these links into the comments. And for those of you that are just joining for the very first time and you have no idea what Time of the Sixth Sun is about, well, we have a movie and an eight part documentary series. It's a 108 minute movie. Beautiful, beautiful movie. And uh, an eight part documentary series that goes with it. They don't have to be watched. Um, they, they can they all stand independently of each other uh, in on eight different topics that we go deep dive onto the uh, subjects that we cover in the movie. And anyone can register to watch for free for a limited time. You just need to go to timeofthesixsunlaunch.com and I'll put that link in the, in the comments too. So uh, let me bring that slide down and I'll uh, pass over to, uh, to Nikki Luna. Yay, feels good to have our sweet soul sister back. So um, just remind us for the new viewers who are not familiar with you, Pat, um, your name, your name and your tribe of where you're from, first of all. Okay. <clears throat> so um, my mama named me Patricia Catherine McCabe, and there's a giant long story in that name, but we won't go into it right this second. Um, it, it's a, it tells a lot about history and many things, but um and so I come from the Diné Nation. Other people know us as Navajo, as my daughter says, incorrectly know us as Navajo. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so in that way, I'll greet you uh, in the traditional way that, that we do. So I'll say, Sha'e'iya, Tachi Inishli, Aro Ashi'i Bashishchi, Ma'adish Gejne Dashanali, Klaus Chi Dashiche, Kwetao Stari Nishli. And then I was also adopted into the Lakota spiritual way of life. And in that way, I was given the name Wiakpa Najimwi, and that translates roughly to, in English to uh, womaning, standing, shining. <laughs> because uh, that's to, to be the female of our kind is an energetic and an action and, um, and a force and a frequency. So I'm kind of acknowledging all of that uh, by adding I used to be woman stand shining. Now I'm womaning standing shining. <laughs> so it's ever evolving, you know. <laughs> I, love I love that. So well, you certainly do shine, my darling. So <laughs> we met uh, back in Nagpur in 2009 at a, um, a gathering of ancient traditions, and we've had several people on the show since um, we last spoke with you. So Adam Yellowbird, Ariana Platten. And also Philip Cargom, who were all Philip is that was the head of the Bards, Ovates, and Druids, uh, and we had him on the show a couple of weeks ago. So um, I just want to ask you: it's a bit of an obscure question, but what do you think that you bring with you energetically this time that wasn't present in December? Because a lot has passed since then. <laughs> Yes, and actually, if you don't mind, I'd like to um, open with a prayer. Is that? I'd that love you to open with a prayer. Please. Sorry, love yeah, you. It's okay, it's okay. Um, oh, maybe everybody can just take a deep breath here. So I'll say, "Wakantanka tunkashila onshimaka." Shema Shache, holy people all around. It's me, Wiakpa, Najin Wien, coming before you on this holy day on Pitukile. I just want to say greetings to you at this uh, midday where I am, and maybe it's uh, morning or evening where my relatives are watching from. Um, but I just want to invite you into this conversation, Holy Spirit, and uh, I want to invite you into this conversation, Holy Mother Earth. I want to invite you into this conversation, all of our spiritual help and all that serves life, light, and love. Um, let, let everything that we do at this time um, uphold the honor of being human being, 
let everything that we do at this time um, uphold uh, the thriving life way of this of this place, that, this creation that we were placed in, this Mother Earth. And I just ask that this time that we're going to spend together here, these uh, 90 minutes or so, um, that they uh, help each one of us to, to understand, to open to, to find joy in full participation in the very highest possibility for life and light and love. We want to live, Creator God. <laughs> we want to live. We want to live with all of our relations, the flying ones, swimming ones, creepy crawling ones, four-legged ones, all the plant nations, standing nations, stones, waters, mountains, sky, all of this beautiful Mother Earth creation and, and beyond, out and out. We have our a beautiful uh, visitor coming our way, uh, Neo Wise. They call they call that one uh, that the comet that's traveling over us right now, bringing some kind of medicine and message and help to us. And um, and so we send um, this this time and these good words out to travel along with our relative and spread news of the heart of humanity, the intention of humanity to to come into to wholeness, to come into oneness, to fulfill the very deeply um, thought about <laughs> design of, of, our, of our kind and our contribution to creation, the five-fingered ones. Um, we wanna live, we wanna live with all of our relatives and we um, know that we have an opportunity to find harmony, balance and peace. So we reach out to all the help that is, that which stands for life, light, and love to be among us and to work with us and to help us to um, help this Mother Earth also fulfill her role and her destiny um, within our solar system and out and out into the multiverse, into the cosmos, and um, all the ways in which she can participate in all the many, many unfoldings and changes and evolutions and dreams and possibilities that are going on. And I just am so grateful for this opportunity to walk upon her and to be with all my relations at this time. So, oh, mitakuye oyasen for all my relations. Very beautiful. Well, that's all my questions in your prayer there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting you were saying about Neo-wise and someone did ask us in one of the last shows did, did we have any thoughts about it? And I really know nothing about Neowise. Do you have anything to share with us about the comet? I, I really don't. Um, <laughs> I know, I'm sure my elders do, but I actually, that's a, that's a pretty big blank for me. I just, it's more in yeah. my imagination and, my, and in my heart. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, um, I concur what you said about it bringing, bringing to us. So you're a key speaker um, at many elders gatherings around the world, uh, Pat, and um, you're such an inspiration and a guiding light, certainly to myself, but to so many women in the world and men. Um, so, but I'd like to know what you might have to share with teenage girls who, to inspire them about their journey into womanhood. Um, you know, at school they have to decide about their what careers they're doing, but they've probably not given a moment's thought to, as to what kind of woman, human being, they want to become. So I wonder if you have a few words of guidance for those young women, girls and young women. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, well, <clears throat> I want to say to the young women, women's nation rising here, um, you are holy, 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 holy being. You are synonymous with earth. You are synonymous with life. <laughs> and what's, um, I think, challenging about that is that this world construct that we have created, man-made construct, like sometimes literally man-made <laughs> construct, <laughs> Um, doesn't doesn't reflect that truth back to us very much at all, and and so um, especially as a young woman, <laughs> uh, it's going to take a lot of strength. It's going to take a lot of um, strength in the sense of of standing for your truth, even though there's not a whole lot around you that's supporting that. Maybe. And so part of the task is to, 
to find what can support you in that truth. So, you know, what I've started calling myself, um, what my people call human beings is Holy Earth Surface Walker. <laughs> well, now I call myself Holy Earth Surface Walker, life bringer, life bearer. And that's a very profound um, uh, role to hold for our kind, the five fingered ones. And I want to tell you that you um, you have very special uh, spiritual capacities that are very linked to your biology. And we're not told about that in, in modern world paradigm. They don't, you know, they might give you some sex ed in some kind of who knows what kind of way <laughs> in school. And they might, uh, you might get to read some uh, women's studies literature um, but even those places, they don't always talk about really what 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 your spiritual capacity is. So I say our biology gives us very powerful spiritual capacity, and this is men, women, and all the genders, uh, the spectrum of genders in between. Um, but what I want to tell you is that you um, you have an opportunity to, you know, part of what I learned about my biology very late, very late in the game, but but at least I got to participate um, for about seven years is that your menstruation gives you um, a very special opportunity to, to access and to, to bond with, to open to um, this mother earth. So this mother earth gives us everything we need to take care of everyone that we love. I mean, think about that. This mother earth gives us everything we need to take care of everyone we love. Hmm. And so that's what we say, you know, in our communities, we say the woman is the backbone of the family. The woman is the backbone of the community. So how does she, you know, if she's going to be that backbone, where does she get hers? Where does she get her juice? Where does she get her, her help and her nourishment? And I'm going to say that, um, especially as a young woman, you have that opportunity to go to this mother earth. And if you will spend some time during your menstruation, or we say moon time, even, even if it's just an hour, I mean, if you can spend day a day there or the whole time there, that's even better. But even just an hour of sitting with the earth and letting the earth know, I'm in this place of dismantling the holy altar of life, mama. And since your plan is life, I mean, I always say, just look around us. She's always doing one thing. She's making more life, making more life, making more life, making more life. And so even if we if we put pavement over her, if we don't keep paving, you know, what happens? That life just comes bursting through the pavement, you know? So we have to stay on top of it all the time. <laughs> it takes a lot to suppress her life. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're kind of willing to try and do that, but um, it takes a lot because she's life. That's the whole plan here. So here you are, the female of our kind. And so at that time, you're dismantling the holy altar of life. And with that also comes um, a spiritual opening. It's a biological opening as well. Um, but you have an opportunity to let your mom know that, you know, look, I'm gonna offer up this very highest offering to you. And whether you literally give your blood to the mother earth, I've been told that it would be really good for us to resume that practice again. Um, but whether you literally do it or whether it's energetic, um, you can offer that to her and so there's a there's a reciprocity that happens in that time. And so as you offer that to her, she also can come and 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 replenish you, give you nurturing and nourishment. Um, and you need that. And you're gonna really need that in the days to come. <laughs> um, because a lot is gonna be asked of, of you as as the female of our kind. Um, and so not only do you get nourishment and nurturing from her, but you also can receive instruction from her. Uh, instruction for how to be here. Instruction for your own life and receive that guidance for your own life, but also for your family, for your community, for your work, for the world. Um, and I'll say that when she speaks, um, in my experience, sometimes she'll just give me a phrase that sounds so simple I wish I could think of an example right now. I'm not probably going yeah. to, but, but just, I mean, it could be like three or four or five words, but there's something about the feeling of when those words come that tell a much bigger story. And even if you can't quite grasp to, to say the whole story, you're probably going to remember that little line of words. Yeah. 
And the thing is, is if you're willing to use those words for to speak to the people, um, they're going to convey all of that backstory, all of that context, all of that medicine story that the Mother Earth <laughs> gifted you with just those simple words. So I encourage you that if you do uh, take up this practice and those words come, say them out loud to yourself every day. Find a way to say them out into the world and they're gonna carry something that this world needs right now. So we we are we are like this with this mother earth, you know, we're 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 right there with her. We have that opportunity to be. Now, because our modern world paradigm is so disconnected from Earth, it, that's why it's so hard for modern world paradigm to support the woman actually fulfill some of her deepest role and her deepest medicine and her deepest assistance to the world right now. So that's why I say you, you, you have to have an inner strength, but you have it. You were given it. <laughs> and if you came here at this time, here I am, the anti finger coming out. <laughs> if you came here at this time, uh, you, you know, I always say, because because it's been kind of a wild ride lately, probably for everybody, right? Even me, for sure. But I always say to myself, you know, my soul knew what was coming. And my soul was like, put me in, coach, put me in. Come on, put me in. <laughs> I can see what I could do. I know I can do it. I know I can do it. You know, and so, boom, here I came. And sometimes, I, I, you know, we come and our memory gets washed clean and we have to, like, find that trail again, right? Yeah. Um, but but it can be done. And this Mother Earth and our relationship with her can really be a big assistance in helping you understand, remember, uh, create for the first time, renegotiate contracts, whatever needs to be done about why you came. Because you came here for purpose. There's no question. Yeah. Nobody shows up on Earth ever without purpose. But right now, oh, my gosh. So there is something very unique, I'll say, even though it might be in cooperation with community, um, that you are here to bring. And so if we can if we can have that assistance of the Mother Earth to help us really remember that and carry that out into the world, um, that's, that's where it's at, as far as I can tell. And then I want to say to you that um, you, and I'm really feeling for the young people right now, Man, you've been asked to to witness a lot. You know, when I was growing up, we should have been thinking about a lot of things. I kind of grew up more as an American girl rather than in a Native American community, just so you know. Um, and uh, so when I say we, I have a lot of we's. I'm kind of schizophrenic in my we's, but um, <laughs> but, but we uh, we didn't we weren't thinking about the stuff we should have been thinking about. We should have been thinking about the oceans then. We should have been thinking about <laughs> what our extraction was doing. But but I kind of got to grow up being pretty oblivious. So I just, you know, was charging forward with my plan to, you know, to make a name for myself and hopefully get rich and I don't know, whatever else was going on that way that, that I was told was, was the thing. This is the way it is here on this earth and this is how you do it. And by and large, I've decided that 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 was very misleading. <laughs> and that's where my own culture, my own uh, indigenous culture has come in to help guide me to say, you know, um, there is another way for a human being to be on this earth yeah. that is in alignment, that is nurturing for the earth, that is harmonious, that contributes to the thriving life of all. So for me, I feel like that's, that's what I'm always trying to get to. And I, and I feel very privileged to, to be amongst a group of humans. I'm talking about my own people, peoples, I have two peoples, um, that, that show me that in this exact same place, under these exact same circumstances, um, humans choose to live in very different ways here. So this modern world paradigm is not the only game in town, never has been. And in fact, it's a death way game. We are seeing how it is a death way. So for us to be this holy earth surface walker, life bringer, life bearer, synonymous with life, synonymous with earth, we're gonna have to step out of that paradigm and step into a life paradigm. So this is, I feel like a task for young women right now mm. um, because you, and this came from spending time um, a couple years ago with the um, Arawaka and the Kogi and the Wiwa people, the elders, the indigenous elders of the Sierra Nevadas, who I consider to be some of the elders of the elders. 
in my book anyway. And so after spending five days with them, you know, they, their final words to us were to the women we say, you must move and speak and act with the authority of the mother. Mm -hmm. To the women we say, you must move and speak and act with the authority of the mother. Whew. Man, that just mm -hmm. rang through my whole body like a gong. Yeah. Right. And so, so that's, that's what I'm learning how to do right now. I mean, I, I, cause it takes a lot to shed all that I was told was how it is around here. Um, but, but since how it is around here and that version was leading, is leading to death, I have to find another way of how it is around here. And, um, and I, I'm going to say part of that can come looking at, um, cultures who have done it differently, but there's a whole new road, uh, new possibilities, new yeah. a newness that's that none of us know anything about. I think is also emerging. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm gonna give a give a little break here in a second, but I'm kind of on a roll, so hold on a yeah. second. But, I'm, uh, <laughs> but I want to say um, to to the young women, then uh, you know, so so how do you stand with that authority in a world? that has tried its best to not only disregard life, but disregard women, right? So there's a strength that we that we have to have that comes from inside, a knowing that has to come from inside. And so we're, we're gonna have to tr have radical trust for ourselves, radical trust. Yeah. And so as we're wayfinding and sort of swimming upstream or even maybe not even in the stream at times, um, you know, we just, ha I have to keep saying to myself, I trust you completely. I trust you completely, Pat. Even, even when I screw it up, because, <laughs> you know, I have to learn how to do this. I have to learn how to do this. Um, but I want to tell you that, you know, um, I really do believe modern world paradigm is falling right now. This isn't temporary. This isn't temporary. This isn't, oh, we're going to, we're going to hop over this hurdle and resume what we've been doing you know, in about six months or a year or even two years. Um, I think this is, this is a very big collapse of a way that was not, was not serving life and was not in alignment with, with what mother earth requires. Yeah. So we have to be aligned with, with her and with that. Yeah. So I guess the last thing I'll say um, is just, you know, we're going to have to have the courage to abandon some of the plans we had. I'm, I'm talking to a lot of young people who are, you know, university bound, were career bound. Yeah. Um, and, and all of a sudden it, it's just gotten pulled out from under you. And it's, it's disorienting and it's confusing, but I just want to assure you that I think it was absolutely all part of the plan. And I believe that you are completely equipped to make that transition and to stand for life. So we, we as women have the authority, a very, very deep authority. It's aligned with the Mother Earth. It's aligned with life itself mm -hmm. to speak on behalf of life. Mm -hmm. And that is what we need to to understand is what is that voice? That voice can be like, like I do, I, I literally speak words. It can be actions, it can be art, it can be dance. It can be a lot of different things, but, but I want you to trust that even though it looks like it's, it's a drop in the bucket, it's powerful. Yeah. It's powerful and it will uphold the fabric of, of life in the end. Beautiful. Beautifully put that. And for mothers watching this, to really sit there with their girls, to make sure they've really taken on those words and get out in nature, you know, to get a kid to go out and sit for an hour by a tree or whatever. It's, it's, uh, that's the first step. Just get out there and commune. Very beautiful. So I was going to ask you about, um, you know, the times we're in. Obviously, we've been heading on a dangerous trajectory for a long time. And uh, so I think for the common good of us all, I think it's a good thing actually where we're at. And of course, I can't equate those words or feelings for all the people suffering and dying in the world. But overall, for our species, we had to, something had to happen, come in and happen, and, and it has. 
So I wanted to know, because uh, it's really nice with speakers from different parts of the world to know how it is for you and with the Navajo tribe on the reservation or Dine, uh, how is it for them? Because I heard that they, they had been hit the hardest actually in North America, tribal wise. Yeah, that's true. We are our people, Dineta, which um, covers uh, mostly in Arizona, New Mexico, but also Utah, Colorado, we're in, we're in the so-called Four Corners area, what is yeah. now known as the Four Corners area. Um, yeah, we are like the epicenter of, of the COVID virus here in the United States. Um, it's, it's a very difficult situation in that uh, because of the way we live traditionally. And I, although I'm gonna say, you know, so I'm working with this really wonderful man, um, Andy Dan, who's um, who's just up and at it every day, getting food out to the people, getting water out to the people, getting medicine out to the people, getting hand sanitizer out to the people, because we're talking about people who don't always have running water and, and such. But yeah. what he reports back is those who are living, like full on living the old traditional lifestyle, they're doing, Fine. They're great. They're not hurting sheep. You know, it's it's not it's not so much them. It's the ones that are sort of halfway in between or very urban, right? That's quite interesting. Um, yeah. So I find that very interesting, very telling, I would say. And um, so and too. so, but but you know, now with people working in larger urban areas and then leaving those areas now that work is collapsing. And then coming back home, um, so now we have situations with households of, you know, like a like a two or three bedroom house that has 12 people living in it or, you know, and so that's what's creating some big difficulty with it. And we also don't have huge, you know, medical centers. Um, we have a few, but they're, you know, everything is very far apart. Like you're, you're used to driving 70 miles to go get groceries all the time. I mean, it's, it's, it's vast, the land out there and it's, and it's sparse in terms of infrastructure, which is, can be a good thing, but right now it's, uh, it's not that easy. So we've been working on, um, uh, we've had some really amazing, uh, I, I just, as just me personally, there's a lot of people working on getting help out to the reservation, but we just had an amazing connection with some folks who um, are 3D printing uh, face masks, um, face shield, I should say, the plastic ones. Um, and so we've been getting like, I think we've got 100,000 of those out to the reservation now. Um, I've been trying to approach uh, the house of Jack Daniels about getting some hand sanitizer out. <laughs> uh, leaning on them pretty hard. They're they're kind of trying to figure out what how they can help. They want to help. Um, <laughs> But um, you know things like that. So the the what I find really amazing about that is these distilleries um, that have historically actually been very destructive to our people might, at, if they choose at this moment, have an opportunity to now help us save our lives. Ethanol, um, yeah, for sure. So I feel like that's a full circle kind of healing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah, I actually have relatives, my cousin's family um, all contracted the virus and um, yeah, really difficult. Uh, they all they all responded in different ways. And uh, so it was a mom and dad, two sons, a daughter and a grandson. And um, they all responded quite differently. And unfortunately the father and the youngest son uh, didn't make it through. So. You know, I say to people, um, it's definitely not a hoax, although there's an awful lot of um, monkey business going on around it because, I don't know, I guess a lot of people are aware, but I'll just say it out loud. You know, there are whole teams of people waiting and watching for catastrophes because they've turned it into an industry and a business about how to capitalize on these things. Yeah. I mean, they really have. It's, it's for real. Especially like, in the USA, I have to say. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. So it's 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 a whole track. So of course, when this hit, you know, all those people, you know, leapt into action. Who knows how much was thought about beforehand or whatever. But but what I keep saying to people is, look, it it is real and it is among us. So we have to be wise, and we have to live to fight another day. So whatever all the other motives are going on around it, um, you know, we have to be realistic about the fact that there is a very difficult disease among us. Yeah. Mm. Well put. It's uh, so much of it is also, you know, how strong the spirit is, how positive we are, and careful as well. I'm yeah. very careful. 
So um, you were just saying in your prayer, you were talking about uh, not so much the hoop of life, but upholding the honor of being human. May we, may we. Can you just uh, explain how you perceive that, the honor of being human? It is an honor, I, I understand that, but from your perspective. Well, um, gosh, I like that well, question. Um, Let's see. Oh, I don't think well, anybody's ever asked me that question, but no. I sure do like that. I get, uh, so I feel like we have low self-esteem as a species <laughs> right about now in general. <laughs> if we allow ourselves to, to go that way. Um, because we feel like, uh, especially before the virus hit, you know, as climate change was kind of making itself into consciousness more or less, although we were feeling quite reluctant to make too many changes still. Um, but it was definitely coming into consciousness and we kind of, I think I was really witnessing a lot of people feeling like, man, everything we touch, we just destroy. And, and a lot of commentary about how, um, if we if we were to disappear, everything would thrive. So in other words, the world would be better off without our kind. Um, and and so I, you know, I, I talk I talk often about the sacred hoop of life, which is for me came to me what understanding I do have of it. I mean, it's it's an endless teaching. I'll never know all of it, but um, what has been coming to me about it from the Lakota way is uh you know that every form of life gets to have a have a place on that sacred hoop and we the five finger ones have also been given a place on that sacred hoop we act like we're the whole hoop we're not the whole hoop <laughs> we get a place on the hoop and all of our other relatives also um were given a, a seat on that on that sacred hoop so for me that says right away wow i've been given this place of honor to, to have been given and you know, be a part of a species that has given a seat on this sacred hoop of life. And, and so we, um, every member has uh, what I call a perfect thriving life design, a way of upholding the integrity of their part of the hoop. And if we think about it, every life form does it in radically different ways. Butterflies do it different than platypus, which do it different than um, seahorses. And, you know, I mean, think about this symphony of life. It's really incredible. And yet all of our relations around us, you know, we say that they all came first and we were the last to come. So we say that they are our elders and they're trying to teach us how to be here. Mm -hmm. We're kind of like the young punks on the block. Right. And, <laughs> and we kind of act like it lately, but, um, yeah. but, you know, so they're, they're supposed to teach us uh, or they, they're offering to teach us how to be here. Um, and so we also have a way, there is a way for us to participate deeply and fully in this earthwalk life that, that creates harmony and that upholds the whole hoop's ability to thrive. Okay. And do we know what that way is? I'm going to say, I think by and large, we've forgotten what that way is, yeah. but, but it's there. And that's an important concept for me to know. I have a perfect design for thriving life. Yeah. And going back to talking to the young women, you know, my inquiry has been, you know, what does it mean to be the female of our kind, of, of the five-fingered ones? Like, what is that specific role that I have to uphold the thriving life hoop, right? And so, so I guess for me, um, I, I feel like, I guess I'll have to go also to this place of, of remembering that, you know, my elders say that we've, we've, we've been through worlds before we've lost worlds. Worlds have, have collapsed. <laughs> and you you know, this, your whole program is called the sixth sun, right? So that's kind of referring to that. I, I, I would imagine, right. It's so it's saying that we've, you know, my clan grandfather says we're in the sixth world right now, or he used to say that to me. Mm -hmm. And so, so this, this is a very uh, powerful time that we're in. Um, it's possible that we'll lose this world. To be honest, it's kind of looking like we will. <laughs> but, yeah. but, but as far as I, as I know, you know, there are those who have who have always been able to travel on to the next world. So far, we're doing such a number on this Mother Earth. Sometimes it's hard for me to imagine how how that seventh world will be. And it could be that we will have to wait a long time for many of the things that, that we've known in this time, in this world, to regenerate. You know, who knows when that will come back. 
So that's that's a deep loss, and that's something a, a, a reckoning that we have to I have to really take in deeply. But nevertheless, you know, so so I feel like um, I have a dear friend. Uh, his name is Sami Awad. He's from Palestine. We've been talking about this a lot, and we've really been talking a lot about how we're not living for ourselves. <laughs> We're, we're living for future generations. So mm -hmm. a lot of people hear about that, about the Native American concept about the seven generations. But, but I mean, I'm talking for real here, you know, like we, we, we can act now in different ways that will contribute. This is, this is how I keep moving forward with, with enthusiasm and clarity. Cause I don't know, looks like we're kind of racing up to a cliff edge, but rather than having that stop me and say, well, what's the point? Um, I say, I can set things up for whoever is going to travel on to that next world in the event that we do run over that cliff edge. So either what I'm doing is going to serve to not have us go over the cliff, or it's going to serve what comes next. Yeah. And, and that's where I want to maintain a deep honor, the mm. deepest honor I can possibly come up with to live my life to, like I said, send my signature voice of the five-fingered one out and out and out through up to our sun, our holy star, and out into the universe and say, that is right. I am a human being standing for my life, standing for the preciousness of life, standing with the beauty of this mother earth, her child, um, her her beloved. And yeah. I claim that place and I, and I send my signature heartbeat out with that frequency, with that honor, with that beauty. Um, and that and, force, that life force. Yes. Mm. And I am here to receive the guidance, the help that's coming from life, light, and love. And I I stand with this place. I receive this place. I claim this place. So, yeah, that's, I guess, what I'm saying when I talk about upholding the honor of being human being. Yeah. It's powerful stuff, isn't it? Yeah, really. Have you got any questions, Ted? Do you want to jump in at all? Or? There are. There, we've had some questions from our, our lovely viewers. So um, I'd like to just put yeah, a, a, few a couple of those in if we can. Um, at 8.03, Monique asks, um, how did the Dine come to be incorrectly known as Navajo? Oh, gosh. <laughs> a hard question? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no, 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 it's not a hard question. I mean, so this is a... This is, this is what happened throughout the United States for all the indigenous peoples. One, our languages are not very much like English. You may have noticed when I was greeting you. Yeah. And, um, and so here's the way of, of what was going on at the time. You know, it was inconvenient to try to learn how to say these things. <laughs> I mean, that was really it. And because, because the, the, those that came and with the colonization had all the power and had the upper hand, they didn't really feel like they had to put themselves out very much to try to accommodate what we, how we saw ourselves because they were out to destroy that anyway. So they just kind of yeah. called us whatever they felt like calling us. And they had their own reasons for calling us these different names. A lot of times they were not kind names. Yeah. Um, and so m many of the indigenous peoples, if not all, I'll say in what is now known as the United States, have been reclaiming their original names and sort of standing in that honor of saying, no, actually, this is who we are. So mm. um, not everybody. There's a lot of Diné people who still use the word Navajo. I mean, I'm not going to stand around and correct anybody, but I choose to say Diné now to claim, reclaim that original, our original. I mean, it's like me introducing myself and saying, I'm Pat. And you say, Gosh, you know, I really like the name Mary. I think I'm just going to call you Mary. <laughs> it's so disrespectful. So like yeah, said, if they have that, that that intention to to kind of destroy, then you can understand it. Their yeah. ignorance. Yeah. Not condoning it. Thank you. So um, your uh, your work right now is re also reconciliating the masculine and the feminine. Uh, there's the the masculine, the men's nation and women's nation. You call it. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And and where did is there a split that happened? And what was that? Well, I understood uh, it correctly. And I'd I mean, also I, like to put I in Dan <laughs> Pat. Can I put in Daniel's question as well? Because he, he, based on what you said Sorry. with the advice for the young ladies earlier, 
or the young women, sorry. Um, Pat, what advice would you give to men who totally identify with what you are saying? So this feeds nicely into Luna's question too. Okay. All right, let's see how we do with this. This little topic. <laughs> um, gosh, I... Uh, so has there been a split? Let's start with that. So my clan grandfather said that um, it's interesting because he 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 indicated to me, and he, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, I, it's not for me to say, I guess, but he left this world last year. So I can't ask him a lot of things. So let, let that be a lesson to all you. Like if you go go look for your elders yeah. and ask them some questions and pay attention because they leave. And when they leave, that's it. That whole library is gone of their understanding and experience. Um, so, so anyway, but he kind of indicated that we had moved from the fifth world to the sixth world during my lifetime. And I, I have to say, I kind of feel like I feel that. I don't know if I can really put my finger on it. Sometimes I feel it in like in the music I used to listen to versus music that's around now. Um, all these different things. But, but he talked about the, the the world the world previous to that. I guess that would be the fourth world. And he said that we lost that world because men and women believed they could live without each other. And that mm -hmm. world was the world that was destroyed by the flood. So yeah. many cultures all over the world acknowledge this great flood mm. um, that took place on the earth. Oh, and um, so, so, so it was going on then, right? And we lost a world over it. So I, I've, I've been frustrated that way, and I've been saying, man, if we're gonna, if we have to lose another world, do we, do we, ha can't we at least have lose it for a new reason? Like, can't we make some progress here? Because I really do feel, in some ways, that we're, we're the some of the deep root of our issues are very much based in 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 this dynamic between these what I like to call functional polarities. So before I go into um, talking about it, I, w I always want to preface by saying, you know, I, I'm, I, uh, I'm not very versed in talking outside of what's probably going to sound a little bit like a very binary point of view in terms of gender. So I'm going to apologize in advance, <laughs> um, but I have to start somewhere. So I'm starting with my own experience and my own relationship way and and um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from but I fully acknowledge that there is a spectrum of gender and and hopefully I can move around to to be able to have some things to say about that as well but not so much today um, so I acknowledge that but uh, so I guess what two things happened that really put me on this road and this is like one of my one of my deepest um, uh, tasks, I guess I'll say, or things that I've been willing to take on, and and my favorite sex is is this reconciliation. Two things happened that really changed everything for me. One, I was as I was coming into my elder woman time. We were talking about that before we got on went live on air. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I was getting, you know, everybody kept telling me as as you become the older woman, you're going to become invisible in this world. And they would say things like that to me. And then they would tell me about some of the physical symptoms that we go through, and et cetera. But anyway, I, I ended up in this sweat lodge and I was really, really angry. Kind of a very classic thing happened for me. My my husband left as I was heading into menopause and ended up with someone half his age. And the whole, it just, it's, what a thing. What a dynamic we are. <laughs> and so I was really angry and I um, and, and very sad. And so I went into this ceremony and I was just really railing about it. And um, to, to my brother's credit, they, they, they held the ceremony and they, you know, let me do what I needed to do and let the ceremony take care of us all. Um, so I'm always grateful for them in that one particular ceremony because I was really like raging and screaming and clawing the ground and, and having a really big fit. And in the middle of it, you know, uh, or actually it was later that night, um, I got woke up and and I was asking, you know, what do we really mean when we say feminine? What do we really mean when we say masculine? Because th those words are so loaded with, uh, you know, modern world paradigm, culture, all different cultural baggage, I guess you could say. Yeah. And the spirits came to me and they said, um, that's a really good question because you think you know what masculine is, but you don't. And you think you know what feminine is, but you don't. All you know is how those two energetics behave in a power over paradigm. 
Mm. But if you plug them into a different paradigm, they will behave in a very different way. Mm. Oof. So well, we've, had, we've had glimpses of that already. We can see that. Well, yeah, and and I have a little bit more than a glimpse of that in my own cultures because mm. we're not we our paradigm is not modern world paradigm. I mean, it's kind of becoming a meld a little bit right now because of colonization and other things. But 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 intact culture is a very different paradigm, and so gender is treated in a different way. You know, as I was talking to the young ladies earlier, I'm speaking from that other paradigm, mm. right? And so. So for a woman's menstruation to be held as one of the deepest assets that humanity has, and it is, <laughs> um, versus a culture that tells a young woman, we don't wanna see it, we don't wanna know about it, don't show any evidence of it, and we expect you to act like nothing is happening every single month until it's gone. And then when it's gone, we would really prefer that you take hormone pills so that we don't notice that you're changing either while you're at it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's pretty intense. It's pretty intense, right? And um, and so I, so to, I guess to go back to to this this other, what happens when you when you plug these energetics into a different paradigm? So that really made me think about many things. And I kind of already knew, like I said, what it means, you know, being a woman. But I really started thinking about it for the men. Because, um, so in a power over paradigm, might makes right. It's all about power. And so I always see it as this pyramid. And right now we're talking about how all the fruits of the labor flow from this bottom rung all the way up to the top. And right now they're all just staying right up here in this 1%, right? Yeah. That's kind of a, a realization we've been having. Not really sure what to do about it just yet, but we're definitely having that. And it's, and it's definitely playing out the more that COVID... Is, is showing us, is continuing to show us some yeah. very harsh realities and truths about ourselves. But um, so, so in this paradigm where might makes right, men are going to dominate because literally it, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's who can overpower another. In order to have what you need in this paradigm, you have to overcome someone else to get what you need. Mm. So it's a constant competitive, brutal, violent. It's inherently violent system. It's not conducive to cooperation or collaboration in any way, shape or form. And uh, lately I've been adding this piece to, to saying that, which is, and on top of it, there's this whole, um, even if you don't practice, there is a very deep Christian values, puritanical overlay over that whole thing. So on the one hand, you're like in a dog, dog eat dog fight for what you need meanwhile you've got this christian overlay that's telling you to be good and to be kind and to love your neighbor so it's it's just completely crazy making yeah. it's completely crazy making right there's no way to do both and yet yeah, such a put on you to, to be done right so so what i what i'm trying to get to here is that so men are going to dominate in this and even though it might look like at least formerly when we could all go into big glass office skyscrapers in the sky and men were wearing very pretty clothes and sh nice shoes and ties and etc you know but that violence that cutthroat competition is just under the surface i mean it's mm -hmm. right there it's not quite fisty cuffs although i'm sure it does come to that sometimes yeah but it's it's right there and so, you know, when I thought about what they were saying, I thought, okay, so this is who the masculine becomes when it's plugged into this paradigm. Mm. But who would the masculine be if it were plugged into a different paradigm? So, so do you get an image for that? Because it was very apt, obviously, the, the pyramid and seeing the structure of it for that masculine domination. But the other paradigm, how does that visually look? Um. Well, let me let me just finish this one little part here because I feel like this is really important yeah. to say. So, so, so when I considered what would the masculine look like if it were plugged into a different paradigm, what that also made me realize is we've been, I have been, and I'm going to say many, a pretty par big part of we have been equating men with this power over paradigm. We've been equating men with patriarchy. So I'm going to call patriarchy power over paradigm now. And I'm going to, because patriarchy just keeps, keeps us locked into 
this is about men. This is how men are. This is what men do. And I'm going to say, no, I don't buy it. I don't believe it. I don't think that's the thriving to life, thriving life design of, of the masculine and of men. Yeah. And uh, so I'm just kind of shouting that from the rooftops lately. Men are not patriarchy. Men are not the power over paradigm. But when you are presented, and some people might say, especially other indigenous people, that this is giving too much leniency <laughs> for all the destruction that it has wrought. But when you believe that that paradigm is the way earth is, if you're born into it and all you ever see is that paradigm and you are taught to believe, that's all there is, man. That's what this place is about. That's how this place works. That's how this place operates. So you got to get with it. You got to figure out how to be a winner in this destructive paradigm. Mm. Um, and yet it's killing the men. I mean, the men are committing suicide in unprecedented numbers right now. That's true. Um, because it's not, it's not compatible with a human heart, yeah. masculine or no. It's not compatible with a human spirit to to really live in that kind of cutthroat, non-cooperative, non-collaborative, non-trusting and excruciatingly lonely way that men have been asked to live in that paradigm. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm holding you men mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm sending my love to you because, and I wanna say, I acknowledge that. And I want to tell you that you're not meant to win in there. It's a trap. It's rigged and it will break you. <laughs> it will break you. And you know what? As a woman, I want to tell you, I want you to come out of there before that happens. I mean, right now it's falling. So you might as well come on out anyway. But but even, even before I was saying to men and I'll say it to you today, I, I want you to come out of there. I don't want you to break. I need you to be whole. Yeah. I need you to be whole in order to do what I need to do. Because I, I need you to stand with me as I stand with that full authority of the Mother Earth and as I stand with the authority of life. And the and memory. I, I call it out, right? Like, you got to stand with me. You got to stand behind me. You got to support me. You got to protect me. You got to preserve me for as long as possible until I come to that point where only I can meet what's coming. Mm. Wow. Beautiful. It's so it's so um, it's so difficult because I see this uh, I see this going on all the time. It's quite it's quite amazing how quick people are to jump into the man versus woman thing. You know, you you put up a post that could be, for example, um, quite quite innocent. Yet somebody will jump in and go, "There's it's it's you know, it's patriarchy," or it's you know, this is this is against the women. Or but it, it's it's very difficult to find as a man to find that balance. And everything you've said so far, I, I wholeheartedly agree with. I mean, my my wife, my partner, um, my beloved, she uh, she read a book that said if every woman was to take their their moon at the end of you know at the end of each cycle and to bury it into the earth with prayers, the earth would heal. I mean, it's and the 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 feeling of that, the the power of the of that lunar cycle, you know, that moon cycle that, that the woman has, you know, the bringers of life. It's 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 it's, it's gives me goosebumps. And, in, and exactly what you say, you know, the, the, yet you see television adverts of women on their moon jumping out of airplanes doing parachuting. Well, I, I can tell you, for being being the uh, partner of a woman for 19 years, that is the last thing she would want to do on the first day of her moon. Right? That's what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's madness. It's madness. And it, and it is that. It's that sort of, well, no, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't talk about that. But where did that come from? Where did it go from this beautiful, life-giving you know, ceremony that happens every 28 days yeah. to this. Oh, we don't talk about that. It's quite, quite I, amazing. I, I remember the moon teachings, 13 moon teachings of grandmother or abuela um, from who is in Peru with us, grandmother Margarita. And um, she, she was saying about saving a little bit of your menstrual blood. So whether it's just squatting in the garden, allowing it to flow into the earth, or taking it and drying it and putting it in a file around your neck and scraping a bit off into the sacred fire. But by doing that, by women offering their blood, it cuts that violence, that need to draw blood for men to kill, to maim. And uh, yeah, that made a lot of sense to me. 
in that mm. respect of the moon blood. It's, um, right. It's our, it's our only way to make a blood offering that, that yeah. doesn't take life or destroy life. It only enhances life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so I'm going to ask you again what that looks like. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to ask me what? I'm, I'm going to ask you again, what does that look like? Because we live in an alternative community and there are some gorgeous, really gentle and not part of that paradigm you're talking about. So I was saying we are getting glimpses of it already with the, the, the new kids coming through and we are creating it as we speak. But I haven't re really thought about it in form of a, a, what shape it is. I mean, I would so naturally say a circle or... You know, but I'd have to think about that more. I just wondered what it looked like for you, the new, the different paradigm that you want men to climb out of. Hmm. Well, as my clan grandfather says, um, it's so old, it's new. <laughs> yeah. The paradigm that we're maybe looking at. For. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but I will say that I think that there is something new that's being asked as well. Like I said, something that maybe none of us know anything about, um, not, not ancient culture either. Um, but uh, let's see. It's kind of like the void actually, isn't it? Of no, no shape, no structure. No, I, I don't feel that way. I feel like, um, okay. So, so I should talk about the second thing that happened that changed everything. <laughs> Also, yeah. and that is that um, when actually I was at Findhorn for the New Story Summit, mm -hmm. and during that wonderful, chaotic, wild ride that we were all on, that was really necessary. Um, mm -hmm. What what really came to me was rather than try to tell a new story from this point forward, we would be better off retelling the old story. And if we go back and we retell the old story, it'll automatically change our trajectory into the future. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so rather than try to tell a new story from this point forward, we'd be better off retelling the old story. And if we go back and retell the old story, it will automatically change the trajectory into the future. Mm. I like so, that. Yeah, there's something about that that like lands in my body when I heard it. And actually it's been the basis of most of my activities since then, that was 2014. Um, and so I thought, wow, that sounds great, but what in the world am I supposed to do with that? Well, I didn't have to wait too long. Um, what ended up happening was I ended up having these like really intense visions about what took place during the witch hunts in Europe come over me and they lasted for almost a full year. And uh, I won't go too deeply into that. It's it's very triggering and everything. Yeah. I don't know if we need to do that part right now, but yeah. we can sometime if you ever want to. <laughs> but, I'd love to have you back to talk specifically about that. Yeah, yeah, it's a very long, beautiful story. But um, but I uh, yeah, I almost lost my life in it. It was that deep, the, the visions. I was and I almost went mad, <laughs> and um, but they, I didn't. So, but 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 in that. You know, this elder spirit grandmother came to me and she said um, that there was something we could do. Like if we were to, if I were to g gather women from all parts of the earth, indigenous women, or women who had a, a memory of the old understanding of who women, who the woman is to creation and who creation is to the woman. And so I was to gather these women and bring them to Europe and let them speak the truth of that understanding out loud, one after another, for for some days they said, just do it, and that vibration of that that truth would become so powerful that it would realign the misunderstanding and the lies and the deceptions, everything that went on in terms of our understanding um, during the witch hunts, and they named the witch hunts in Europe as one of the archetypal woundings of humanity. Um, and so it's kind of like that was a fork in the road that we took that really kind of led everything to go haywire in a very special way. <laughs> um, and so they said, yeah, that would be a really good place to retell the story. Um, and so we did that. We had, uh, we had women from Colombia, 
Chile, Mexico, Malaysia, Australia, Namibia. Um, did I say Australia already? Yeah. Uh, another Diné woman, myself. Um, and, and so we went to England and Spain, Spain, <laughs> France, mm -hmm. Italy, and we did these, what we called, what we ended up being called the human reunion ceremonies. And, um, and what I learned in that process, you know, I thought I knew what was up with the witch hunts. I'm like, if you would ask me at the very beginning, you know, what, what means healing? I would have said, it's this, this, and this, and especially those damn men. we got to heal what those damn men did. I, mean, I, I just was absolutely certain, you know, I mean, I always felt like every time you say witch, witch hunts, the men are always like, oh my God, no, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and, uh, and what I learned though in it was that the masculine was just as deeply violated as the feminine was because the men, I'm going to say from my perspective coming out of what I've learned in my journey back home to my own indigenous cultures, I would say the archetypal spirit, the, the spiritual archetype for the men are to be protectors of life, to be protectors of the life bringer and the elders and the children, and also to be the provider. And, and so I always, here's a little sidetrack, but I'm going to say, you know, I, whenever I say that out loud, and I know there might be men listening, I just want to say, I know that that is not good news <laughs> for a man at this time to be a protector, especially now that we're really coming into, I mean, I, I was saying this two years ago and a year ago, and it didn't have the same meaning as it does right this second. As we approach martial law, it's like, wow, this is no joke. I don't know if you were noticing what's happening in the United States right now, but holy smokes. Yeah, um, um, yeah we're, we're having martial law coming down pretty, it's trying, it's making it an attempt right now. But, you know, so how is the man supposed to be a protector in that? How is the man supposed to be a provider in a rigged, in a system that is rigged, an economic system that is rigged against him. So I get it. Those are not easy words. But I want to tell you that you also have the support and help of Thriving Life Paradigm and of Mother Earth and of the feminine if we can heal ourselves enough to, to help that way. Mm -hmm. So what happened for me um, was realizing that, you know, at that time, the men, the men were not able to enact that very archetypal um, way that they have. So life was not being protected. Life was being violated and, and life and, and being able to provide was also difficult because that was also about an economic change structure, moving into capitalism, moving out of the way of the circle, like you said, into this way right here. Yeah. And so um, I had to realize that, that that was very violating for the men. When a man is not able to protect what he what his spiritual mandate says he is to protect, it changes him. It changes him deeply, fundamentally. And we know that from our men. There was no way for our men to stop that onslaught that is came it to us. Because they are emasculated as a as a man, they've got no power. Right. So it it, it can it can I, I I mean I have to use that word. It renders a man impotent. Yeah. It gives it puts a man in a place of non agency. Yeah. And so, for we know what the results of that are for our men. African American men also experience the same, well, men in Africa and in other places in the world, but those are two really big examples that I live around here in the United yeah. States. And so, it changes the men, and, and it usually changes them in one of two ways either they become perpetrators of violence themselves, so we call it internalized, anyway. Yeah. Um, or they become non-agents. So this is so when you know, in, as part of the racial slurs around men of color, you know, they're always said they're they're so lazy. They're just so lazy. Well, they're not lazy. They they were traumatized in a very specific way that stripped them of their agency. And these this also because multi generational. So it's also the sons and the grandsons. So what I really came to realize of what took place in Europe is one, y'all fought it for hundreds of years. You didn't just roll over and take it. No, you guys fought it for hundreds of years. And it took time for them to break, break you down. And, and they haven't succeeded entirely as we learned at the um, gathering in Nagpur, right? Um, but, 
but but it, it definitely changed your landscape and in Europe. And so they perfected that methodology. They, they created a methodology for breaking down the human and, and making the human leave the circle and become enslaved to this other structure, right? And so they perfected that on you all in your own nations in Europe, throughout Europe. And then the sons and grandsons who, were, who had experienced that trauma were the ones who were sent on the ships out to the world over to us. And I've often wondered, you know, I had, I had went through another really vicious round of, of visioning that was as difficult as this one I'm describing around the witch, what took place during the, the so-called witch hunts. Um, and this other visioning that I had was, was when the soldiers rode down on my people for the first time in Canyon de Chez in Arizona. And what, what really struck me most in that vision, because I got to see it a bunch of times, way more times than I ever wanted to, was the blankness in these men's eyes. It was like nobody home. They were just like violent killing machines that were not connected to their own heart or spirit or anything. I'm like, you guys didn't even know us. How could you be so vicious? Like, it's not personal in other words. Yeah. You know, there was no personal thing that happened between us, but yet you could just ride down on us that way. What in the world was that? I mean, I'll never forget that feeling of seeing that. Well, it took all those years later for me to realize, well, it's because these are the sons and grandsons of those traumatized men who were who who had no capacity to save the life bringers. And they used to make the children watch what they did so that they would be so clear as to who they were and who they were not and what their level of agency and power would be, right? Mm -hmm. So when I realized that, it kind of not only changed my view about the masculine, suddenly I have this like enormous capacity for the uh, compassion for the masculine and for their dilemma and for mm -hmm. what has occurred for them and how they have come to be in this position of being violators now. And so, but, but not only that, there was also this other beautiful healing that took place, which was to realize that you know, because the people in Europe fought this way, they, you fought it for hundreds of years, just like we are fighting it right now, this minute, today. Our brothers and sisters in the Amazon are fighting tooth and nail right now to try to save our lives. My God, they're trying to save our lives by keeping these mad people, men, off of the, the rainforest and off of what we, what this planet has to have to support life. And so, so, you know, you fought for humanity and, and because you fought for humanity, that might've been one less blow that my people had to take, that another indigenous people had to take. And that might've been just the difference to allow us to continue on and survive and continue to be able to put forth the library of understanding of how humanity lives on earth in a thriving life way. So all of a sudden I had a really big healing in terms of me and my, my European relatives. Cause I'm like, we are bound, we are bound in this business. And I want to say one more thing. Um, uh, I was told, <laughs> so in my cosmology, there is something called the trickster and and I know a lot of people think about trickster or have heard of this in indigenous ways, but I want to tell you that trickster can be very playful and can point out our little foibles and stuff, but, but trickster also can be quite sinister, yeah. uh, much deeper than, than that playful being. Yeah. Um, my, my, my elders say that we must take that quite seriously. And so what I was told at that time when we were doing those ceremonies was that Trickster has been among us since the very beginning. And Trickster, so, so as Thich Nhat Hanh says, and as, as Thich Nhat Hanh calls us an interbeing, in Lakota we say mitakuye oyasin, all my relations were all related. Um, even uh, what James Lovelock talked in Gaia theory has his version of this too, right? Um, and so as if we're interbeing, then the way, so trickster for whatever reasons is intent upon seeing if this way, this place can be destroyed. 
So how do you destroy an interbeing? You create the illusion of separation. And so I was told that, you know, Trickster's been, been among us since the beginning. And um, Trickster has been trying to deceive us into giving away this life of our own free will. It has to be from our own free will yeah. or it won't really be destroyed because we live in a free will construct. And so if Trickster were to just like blow up the world, that would, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have given our consent or in our own free will, but, but, but Trickster can trick us into giving it away of our own free will. And I just say, take a look at modern world today. Once, even once we knew what was happening with climate, yeah, we're still not making a choice with our own free will to choose life. We're still saying, gosh, but I still love doing what I love to do. And I still love jetting across the world. And I still love getting gobs of money. And I still love, you know, all that stuff. So that is us giving it away of our own free will. But mm -hmm. what, what I was told at that time was that, so Trickster has used um, uh, economic disparity, race, even our view of the divine to create separation. But the, but the big one has been to create the illusion of separation and war between masculine and feminine and between men and women. And that one has been the most effective and longest running one of all. And so I have been wondering, like, why, why is that? Why is it so effective? And I think it's because it can take place in any arena, any level of wealth, any race, any religion, any anything. <laughs> it's like, because because those those two energetics are there, they're present. Mm -hmm. And so um, when when that one gets engaged, um, man, we're we're toast. And so what they said to me, the spirits at that time, was they said, you know, you you guys have been had. You guys just keep going for the divide and conquer bait over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. And but now you are being asked to birth yourselves anew. So that's what this time is as, as a species. And so therefore, you have to heal this wound that's at the core of your procreative ability. It is it is mandatory for you to do that. And so for me, everything that I experienced in those ceremonies and, and what was shown um, has made me f come to have a very, very serious, deep commitment to that reconciliation. Okay, I've got, we've got 15 minutes left. I have a shitload of questions, but I recognize this is exactly what we were meant to speak about. So just staying in that same vein, is this okay, Teo? Yeah, yeah. Bringing in questions is I, I believe the importance of forgiveness ceremonies, but on a mass scale globally, are so needed in order for us to move forward out of that separation. But in order to do that, we have to have an authentic common ground, something that unites us. And I think that that one thing is that interconnectedness of all things. Once we can all relate to that and relate to being the oneness, the brother, the sister, the, you know, two leggeds, four leggeds, crawlers, swimmers, flyers, everything that you said earlier. It's um, so, because then we can start from the heart, the place of the heart. And it's interesting when I went to, I flew to South Africa to ask that exact question of our lovely Des, Desmond Tutu. And he said to me that, well, that's why we vote in our leaders, so they can speak on our behalf. And I, we only had 15 minutes with him, but that wasn't, that wasn't doing it for me because I think it takes somewhere, it takes every single human sovereign being to stand in their own place to be able to forgive and say sorry and cry those tears. So I don't know how we get there but I know it's really important. Okay, here's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd have the answers, mama. <laughs> but um, but, but like a couple of things were like rolling up right away. First of all, we have to realize paradigm is a choice. Paradigm yeah. is a choice. It's not a given. I mean, there is a given paradigm in a way in that there are certain conditions that have to happen on this mother earth in order for life to continue and especially to thrive. 
And until we really fully accept that she's not going to bend her way to us, no, not going to happen, friends. We have to bend our will to, to her way. So I say, seemingly, the Mother Earth um, does not compromise <laughs> that way. She's, she's, she has her way, and she, um, and she will not be overcome either. Uh, I say, but fortunately, her way seems to be all about cooperation, collaboration, creativity, unconditional love, um, nurturing, diversity, um, just all of these beautiful, beautiful things. Yeah. So it's kind of ridiculous that we're like fighting tooth and nail against her way because her way is actually, uh, I also say her economy is, is radical abundance and fearless generosity. Beautiful. If you have, if you have a fruit tree in your yard, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If you try to make sure that none of that fruit goes to waste, man, you're going to have your hands full because that's her way. And then inside each fruit, there's like five seeds ready to grow another tree. You know I mean? That, that is her economy. That is her way. And yet look what we've done with, with, with creating our own paradigm. We've made it um, scarcity and hoarding and everybody fighting each other to get any little scrap that they need. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So we have to recognize paradigm is a choice and we can choose another paradigm. We have that power. Because I think people are already. I do believe people are choosing that new paradigm already, floundering around, following those those uh, qualities that you are talking about. I know mm -hmm. they are. And I and I also feel that that we um, have to recognize that, or we have an opportunity to recognize that that we actually can be deep contributors to the thriving life of the whole. And this is something that I really love my daughter's work. You should talk to her sometime, by the way. She's yeah, okay. Lila June okay. Johnson. Um, but she's doing her PhD work right now on traditional land management practices. And what I find it so fascinating, this thing that she says, um, you know, because they're taking core samples out of the earth, which by the way, for indigenous peoples is a very big deal to just go yeah, and yeah. dig a hole into the body of the mother earth. So there's a whole process that has to go on around that. But when when we do that, we can see the layers over time of what has taken place in an area. And so we see, we know what kind of vegetation, for instance, plant life there was in an area because of the pollens that are present in that layer, right? And then we see that when 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 humanity came in in a paradigm of thriving life, that 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 the place just exploded with life and diversity mm. in a beautiful, beautiful way. Everything came to life and thrive. Why? Because we came in. So I really say that to us because it's yeah. It's different than kind of, can you feel how we kind of shed our, our shame and our, it was like, no, we can be that for this life. We can, we can. And, and we have to choose that. Um, I'm I not hate sure. to sound fluffy, but I do, you know, Jeffrey Hoppy, the, who's a channel and was the narrator for the film, but he talks about, well, you know, we are angels who came down to have the human experience. But I feel that every day I feel that I'm moved I was feeling very tearful and anger, angry before when you were talking about, you know, how we've been treated. Yeah. Really. Well, yeah. there's one there's one really important piece that I wanted to say, um, and it's related to this question of how. <laughs> so I've been speaking a lot about consent, and this actually came up um, for anybody who's paying attention to the United States. I guess a lot of people pay attention to the United States, but. Uh, and I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but it wasn't my fault. I, I've been doing everything I can. But anyway, um, uh, and so when the when the Kavanaugh hearings came up for the nomination of, of Judge Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh to join the Supreme Court, and we had our courageous um, woman come forward to tell her story about the sexual abuse that she endured by this man, yeah. and just see what happened then. It was, I mean, it was outrageous. It reminded me a lot about the witch hunts, actually. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, what I what I got from that was I was thinking to myself, can a woman ever really give consent in this life, in this power over paradigm? 
can, can we really ever really truly give our full consent when the justice system cannot hear us and will not stand for us, when the economic system strips us of our, our labor, our heart, our love, our relational capacities, and either says it has no value or less value than anybody else, when our health systems say, you know, dominate the way that they do and, and won't, insurance won't cover the things that women really need for themselves, and that's a way of controlling us. I mean, in all these different ways, women are, are, are bound, um, at least externally, but not internally externally and and so can she really give her consent under those circumstances or on some level doesn't she have to say gosh i better play ball or i might not have food clothing and shelter and so i went through this really awful period um during those hearings where i was seeing all these women kind of walking around in their groovy clothes and and um and trying to be as empowered as they could possibly be but i just felt like man but but in reality they're all wearing this like invisible shock collar Mm -hmm. of this paradigm and of this culture mm -hmm. and it was it was heartbreaking you know but then but then i started thinking okay well well what about people of color and what about what about non-binary gender folk and so i started thinking about all these other categories of people i'm like can they ever give their consent for those same reasons for the, for the kinds of uh, that inherent oppression systemic oppression that that exists and then i finally started thinking but uh but even even the the white male um, is beginning to experience the um, ravages of that paradigm. Because it's really only, remember, it's only these guys way at the very top that actually go with it now. So then I started saying, well, gosh, is anybody giving consent anymore? <laughs> and I was like, no, I, don't, I think hardly any of us are really giving true consent. And, and here's I wonder, why. I wonder if the gender, gender bending of the youth i don't mean that in any way rudely that was maybe a bit clumsy but is their way of stepping out and creating a new paradigm set paradigm saying we don't care i wonder yes well i really do think that all the movement around gender has much more to do with power the power over paradigm than spiritual and biological mandate so as long okay. as we're clucking around around gender, I'll just go ahead and say that that's my feeling yeah. about it. But what I'm going to continue on about consent. So, so the reason that, that it's important to consider consent to me is if we live in a free will construct, which I believe we do, hmm. um, then every the, the, another aspect of that that I don't think I had thought about until recently is that that also in a way says that every being has sovereignty, has to have the sovereignty to enact their free will choices, but also has to have the sovereignty, be given the sovereignty to enact their thriving life design. And this is what makes me understand indigenous cultures, deep respect for plants, animals, waters, etc. because we're saying these are beings that have sovereignty and I must not interfere in their ability to enact their thriving life design because, well, one, they're my elders and two, I love them, but also ultimately it affects the whole, the whole construct, right? Yeah. So each being has sovereignty. And so what that means then is that for me to overrun somebody else's sovereignty, um, is a deep spiritual violation. And so that means I have to do that, I'm doing that over their consent. Yeah, absolutely. And so what's really important about this is, is that anytime one being overcomes the free will of another, an yep. accounting must come due, that's spiritual law. Mm. And so I believe in modern world paradigm, we've been talked out of our consent. We don't even think about our consent. We just say they're going to do what they want anyway. So what does it matter whether I object or not? I'm going to find a way to, to keep my spirits up and muddle through, you know, but we're not really engaging with our consent. But I want to say that if we become conscious of what and, and state, I give my consent to this. I do not give my consent to this. Okay. By doing that, we, we hold on one second. We we cause our our adversaries to 
cross that spiritual line. And when they cross that spiritual line, if we have declared our consent and they cross that line against it, we engage spiritual law and an accounting will have to come due. Whereas if we ignore that place of consent, we do not engage spiritual law and no accounting comes due. And I'm saying we got to make every place accountable. And one of the ways we do that is by being conscious of our consent. There, said it. Well done. I agree. And I think that's the basis of common, the common law movement is whenever a police officer or anyone says to you, do you understand? It is no, I do not stand under you. No, I do not understand. I do not consent. And that's, you know, that's a whole other conversation about sovereign law. But uh, I think people are very much looking into their sovereignty. Let's tell you, let's give you a word because you've... <laughs> I've thoroughly enjoyed sitting here and just absorbing all this information. Some evenings I love to chat and interject, but other times I just want to sit back and absorb. Yeah, yeah. It's been one of those beautiful... But do you see sovereignty around you as something that is... I, I hear, I absolutely hear what you were saying, Pat, but I think that there is a movement very much to that where people will not uh, have that line crossed anymore. They do not consent and they are sovereign and they will... I, I love what that's saying there, though, which is that, even, that, that we just need to get back into the thought processes of I don't consent to this. And the yeah. moment you make that internal decision of I do not consent, as Pat just said, you know, that almost creates that spiritual... Yeah. Wall for you because there is, I foresee so much stuff that's going to, they're going to try and push on us. Yeah, yeah. Are going to try and push on us over the next uh, year, two years. You can see it it's building up all the time. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's a really good thing to remember. It's a really good thing to remember, to, you know, to, to, that we do have rights and we are, in, in, we are sovereign beings. I say it in the movie, you know, and we're answerable to no one. And, but, but most people forget. Because they're indoctrinated in this system and sign those birth parents sign those birth certificates, hand us over to the corporation, and uh, you know, then you just become your good little servant doing what you're supposed to do and not questioning. And uh, unfortunately, it seems to me that this is making a lot, a lot, a lot of people start to question. Absolutely. You said we're answerable to no one, and I'm going to say I would say we're answerable to to everything. <laughs> <laughs> Is sort well, of the I think it was not, not, not answerable to any uh, man, company, or law. We are answerable to to the universal or to great spirit, which yeah. the great spirit does include all of nature: two legged, four legged rivers, right. I, I think it's the flip side of the same coin. But I feel like yeah. we've we've dwelt too long with this sense of we're not accountable to anybody but ourselves. So I want to be sure to say. Yes, it's also, it kind of works out the same when we say we're accountable to the whole hoop of life. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, your point is exactly my point, Theo, in that even if we're not literally out on the streets enacting something in the physical world, if we go through that internal process of just declaring, I do not give my consent, that's yeah. enough. That's enough to engage spiritual law. And mm -hmm. as I've been saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I used to say it a little easier than I'm saying it right this minute, but we're squarely in the domain of the spiritual and that's good news. Um, so we need to be understanding what the construct, the spiritual construct that we're in is about. And that's my new, my new thing to try to say to people is be, have a deep awareness and declare what you give your consent to, what you do not give your consent to. Mm. Deep awareness, beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I'm going to before. Um, it, what time? Are you? We got. We literally got a minute left. So I'm going to bring. Can I just say? I, I th it's this is such an important conversation to be having. Where you listened to my first few questions, but you were going down there, baby. You were digging down, and 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 that needs to happen more. We need to be having these really honest, truthful conversations. So if you would. Consider coming back later in the year, in a few months. I would love that. I know Teo would too. It's yeah. just an ongoing conversation, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, but you know. It's a continuing I mean. story of creation that all of us together are telling right yeah. now. So let me bring up this slide so that people can know, yeah. find out more, Pat. So you can go to Pat's website, patmccabe.net. 
and she's also on facebook.com woman stands shining i'll put those links into the comments uh, just now and um this is the uh this is the last live broadcast that nikki and i'm going to be doing for three weeks i think this is number is it 28 this one 30 30th is one. It 30 so we've been doing this for 15 weeks two two times a week and um <laughs> It's, I've, loved, I've loved every minute of it, the diversity of amazing speakers that we've had on. and What a lovely way to finish it with you, Pat, and all your incredible messages. And uh, thank you so much for, for sharing with us. Um, I will just bring, this, I'll just bring this slide up, if you don't mind. So you can watch the Time of the Sixth Sun series, which is the movie and the eight-part documentary series for free. If you go to timeofthesixthsunlaunch.com. Um, we do have a donate uh, page, which I'll put in the comments. If you've loved these 30 live broadcasts, if you've watched a few of them, you know, we, we are, our ongoing costs are like $1,500 a month in tech alone. So if you can help us with that, even with a dollar or two dollars or three dollars, we absolutely love it. Thank you so much. And uh, if not, you can share these live videos with others. And um, I've also put a post onto our Facebook page uh, tonight, which I'm going to stick into the comments right now. And I would love it if you can't if you, if you can't if you can't do anything else, but you just want to just do something to help us. Then I would love you to visit this post uh, that I've just posted into the comments and um, and share it. Just share it all over the internet because the more people that can see the time of the six sun, the movie, the docu series, um, you know, the, the better because that's really our uh, our mission is to get that message out there as much as possible. And Pat features in three of the docu series episodes as well, and it's there for free. <laughs> yeah, that's right and it's there for free and anybody anybody can opt in to watch it and it starts again every tuesday uh, you can only watch it once because otherwise we don't have people watching in per, 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 what's the word and uh, and there's no reciprocity but uh, but you can go through and watch the whole thing once for free and you've just got to go to time of the six sun.com so um sorry time of this is unlaunch.com so pat thank you thank you thank you yeah thank you so thank brilliant you <laughs> <laughs> he holds it all together. He is the master of his ship. And like, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> the banks, the banks of the river. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you so much. And uh, finally, just to say that when we come back on the 17th of August, we've got a very special uh, gentleman called uh, Erwin Perlman. We'll tell you more about him on the page, on yeah. a flower. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pat. I've really valued everything that's come forth this evening beautiful it was what was meant to be said was said oh thank you uh -oh. if you just stay with us for a little wee moment and uh everyone else good night thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you on the uh, august the 17th yes um, and uh, everybody stay safe and well and uh, if you're watching us on youtube and you want to continue with this energy we have an amazing um facebook group that's now hit over twenty eight thousand people so I'm just going to post this into the uh, into the YouTube channel now here with that one because you can go and join those people because that, that that's where this energy is just continuing day after day. It's fantastic to watch. We had 184 members that I welcomed into the community today. It's just so many people joining all the time, looking for like-minded souls all around the planet. It's beautiful to see. That's what's happening. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah.